humor, haunts, and homicide. Welcome to episode three. Third time's a charm. Humor, haunts, and homicide coming at you. Right here, right now, <laughs> in the flesh, for you, our favorite bitches. Ugh, most favorite. And we would like to talk to our favorite bitches about how our Audios, quality yeah. kind of sucked last week. We understand we're trying different microphones. We think we've landed on one that we really like. So we're just trying to make everything's better and better and better every week for you and we know we can do that and you know we can only grow and that's what we're here to do is just get better so keep the suggestions coming we welcome them and just as a reminder that's admin at humor haunts and homicide.com so please give us your feedback if you have any stories you'd like us to tell anything you'd like us to share if you have a story to share that we can put on the air for you we would love to do that. Hell, if you'd like to be interviewed and tell us yourself, we have a waiver you can fill out on our website, humorhauntsandhomicide.com. I know you want to. You do. So come <laughs> talk to us. Tell us your creepy shit. We want to help you get it on the air and told. So let's talk about what's going on new this week. I'm going to start okay. with um, all my fellow Swifties out there. Taylor Swift. Here we go. <laughs> Taylor go. Swift announced a new album this oh week at the Grammys. Oh my god, did she? She did. Oh, okay. And it's called the Toy... Oh, the no, what? it's not that. It's not that. <laughs> you want to tell me the album name it's, again? <laughs> it's called the Tortured Poets Department. The Toja Cat? <laughs> <laughs> a collaboration you never knew you needed. <laughs> yeah, bitch. Oh, shit. Um, anyway, I'm really excited about it, obviously. Yes, you and are. And then after she announced that, mm -hmm. she... Went to Tokyo like three days late, two days later, I don't know, and forced me to wake up at ungodly hours so that I could watch her perform again with the Eras Tour because it's my most favorite thing. I she needs to quit doing that. Why? Forcing you. Like, yeah, I know, you know? I know, right? I know. It's how dare she. How dare. Yeah. Um, and then today is yeah. the Super Bowl. Oh, yes, it is. Um, I know you are only there for the commercials and the food, but. And Usher. Oh, and Usher. Usher. Yeah. But I'm very excited. Um, because I love football so much, yes. and when the game is over, I will enter my seasonal depression, which is the non-football season. Remind me so. to bring you all the antidepressants <laughs> and all my earplugs, because this is the last time I get to hear you scream, which means my hearing will gradually get better over the next six months, and I don't have to worry about you belting in my ear yeah, I call you, touchdown, fuck you, fuck you, bitch, fuck you, whatever the hell you say. You know? I say a lot of things. It's a lot of Tourette's for football. It's a lot, and I love it. And nothing and... against people with Tourette's, we love you. Um, but Renee does burr out some shit that you would think <laughs> she has a disorder for. That's all I'm saying. I get really, like, mm, really, really amped up. A really, little bit. Yeah, really into bit. it. Yeah. Um, so, mm -hmm. I have a little joke to tell you. You do. Mm -hmm. Please. What is the difference between an enzyme and a hormone? Enzyme and a hormone. Um, <laughs> please share. I'm, I'm stumped. You can't hear an enzyme. Hor you get, did I not get it? I'm, am I that dumb? You can't hear an enzyme, but you can hear a hormone. Okay. I get it. I get it. I'm a little oh slow. Wow. No, I'm a little slow. Wow. Well, you know, funny you say that because I got a joke for you too, friend. How's that? And what's that? What does the receptionist at the sperm bank say as clients leave? <laughs> Do tell. Thanks for coming, bitch. <laughs> <laughs> Get it coming. I uh, yeah. I see. I got it. Okay. I got your. Job. My, mine's a little more clear though, so maybe that's why. You were so, okay. Well, whatever. <laughs> oh, I'm wheezing. That's fun. Maybe probably should get that checked out. <laughs> okay, friends. Okay. We have something else really exciting for you this yes, week. Yes, we do, and we have probably one of these for the next few episodes. Yeah, we're, we're just we're gonna go for it. Trying something. So, um, we have a. RuPaul's Drag Race Mad Lib book that was, I think, gifted to someone on Christmas. I don't know. I got it for my husband. Okay. Uh, well, we've stolen it. We did. <laughs> and now it belongs to Humor, Haunts, and Homicide. That's so. true. Uh, okay. I'm going to read you the first of many. This one is titled The Drag Queen Manifesto. <laughs> okay. Okay. Now, pri pr ugh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> Prior to this, we... Did the whole thing, you know, it tells you to put not nouns and verbs and all that. So we're going to go ahead and cold read this for you now. Here we go. Hold it up. 
We, the drag sex dungeons of RuPaul's Drag Race, <laughs> declare the following MILFs to be self-evident. <laughs> Though Taylor Swift is going to repeat them, for those of you too busy fucking your faces off <laughs> to know what self-evident means, I w I'm just going to stop right here and thank you for including Taylor Swift in, You're in this welcome. mad lib. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Number one, we are all born luscious and the rest is drag. Yes, we are. Number two, if you can't lick yourself, how in the hell are you going to lick somebody else? Can I get an <laughs> OMG? OMG! <laughs> Number three, when stomping down the runway, one must sissy that slut. Sissy it up. <laughs> Number four, unless they're banging your bills, pay them bitches no mind. Pay them up. Where's my money? Number five, you can be a balderdash, but don't be a basic balderdash. <laughs> Never. No, don't do it. And number six, repeat to yourself, before undertaking a new whore, good luck and don't queef it up. <laughs> Oh, shit. Wow. Gosh, that's good. I, I brought me back to high school, you know. I used to love Mad Libs so much. I like, did. And when I saw that, I thought that... I will tell you, I never fucking did... I never... I mean, I was a goody-goody, so let's just be honest. You never I had never, an adult experience not really. with Mad Libs? No, 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 I was good. Well, good news for you. I was you, a nice girl, but... That you can be a bad girl today Thank with you. that awesome, filthy um, Mad Lib. So, we're going to go ahead and... Kind of move into what I've got going on this week. Yeah, okay we that. would love to hear about Ooh, that. Talk man. Hot Mess Express up in here. Let's go. Buckle it up, everybody, <laughs> because I have a tale for you. And this is not my story, by the way. This is just a side piece for you. A little, a little extra cred Ooh, for you. A side piece. A little side piece. Oh, a little scandalous. Side, a little side fling. <laughs> um, so this all started probably back in the summertime. And I will tell you that I, I feel like my husband... Um, I guess it's very passionate sometimes about things, as I am, but this particular passion involves our neighbors. So we're outside on our pool mm -hmm. deck and we smell a gas-ish smell, which I guess some would say propane-y. And my initial reaction is, you know, whatever, man. If there's maybe like a meth lab somewhere nearby or, you know, something fun like that. Nothing I can do to help it and the cops are going to have to sniff it out. And they probably won't do anything either. So I'm just going to let it be. And Dylan is like, no, yeah, no. Enter Dylan. <laughs> oh, damn Dylan. Love him so much. My, my amazing husband. But at this particular moment, he calls the police because he thinks that someone's going to explode their home and hurt people with this meth lab, potentially. So we get the police, they go over to this property, which, you know, I don't know exactly what they did to find this out, but they ended up coming back over to our house probably 10 minutes later on, after they went over there. And they said, well, you definitely were smelling something. And it was probably a gaseous smell because the shed that's in their backyard of your neighbor's, you know, your yard there, they had about 60 dead animals hanging from wires, chickens dead with knives in them, uh, sheep's heads cut off from the body on an altar. Not an alarming thing to hear at all. No. No. no super normal. So normal. Uh, you know, we're in Florida, so things are a little more culturally <laughs> experienced, I would say, around here. And, and, you know, and look, I am very open-minded as a gay man, I feel like. Love what you love. Do what you do. Practice what you preach. Practice what you maybe don't preach. But do it in the safety of, and comfort of your own home that doesn't affect people in the surroundings by you. Now, we deal with, um, you know, I mean, maybe you can speak to some of this experience because you're here dealing with this all the oh, time. yeah. So, uh, one afternoon in particular that I can remember, um, I was over for about seven to eight hours. And no exaggeration, the entirety of the seven to eight hours, these these neighbors were um, drumming. I, I guess we didn't know, we didn't like, we failed to mention that they do like um, religious ritual type things. I'm not even, we're not even 100% sure of the religion, honestly, but um, they will be drumming and chanting and yelling for like seven hours at a time. And it's like not it's just, excessive. It's excessive, but it's not just one of them. There's like 30 of them. Yeah. 30 of them. And, and that one day it was like in the middle of the afternoon. And you, yes. can, you can say whatever. But these bitches are doing it at like one in the morning. Oh, yeah. But uh, it gets worse. It gets yeah. worse because 
one day we were outside letting our dogs out and it was probably like midnight or so and i looked in the backyard because there's really not a lot of um, aerial blockage that we can completely see into each other's backyards at this point and we look over and they're doing some chant they're running around naked and yelling like xena the warrior princess <laughs> And I, I just didn't know what the fuck is going on. So, you know, I don't want to get involved in this. I don't want to even, you know, understand what it is because I my business is my business. Yours is yours. Just don't affect my sleep and we're good to go. I did get invited over that one day, though. They did oh, invite me yes, over. yes, you did. And I... Well, well, and why did they do that, Renee? Well, I might have been... I mean, I might have been spying and videoing them. And by, I mean, I'm responsible. <laughs> and by might, she means she was outside with her camera phone. <laughs> Listen to the camera phone. I'm in the 90s. I was dancing to their drumming. I think they... But anyway, I politely declined. I politely declined the invite. They saw her video <laughs> recording on her phone, and she goes, Oh, oh I'm, I'm just really curious and i just wanted to you know share it to all my followers and she didn't say that but she should have and i will say though i was curious and that would be the way to get me to join a cult is my curiosity like my curiosity would be would be like that that you know and this is why she keeps me in her life so she doesn't do things like this no renee we don't join cults from our crazy neighbors that kill things for fun okay they so, have food. <laughs> plenty of it. Goats and turtles and chickens and sheep and maybe humans. I don't know exactly. Okay, well, I did politely decline. You did. And I'm glad because you're so here anyway. telling this podcast with us yeah. today because of it. So, mm -hmm. um, But the most recent fun with this, I had gotten up and maybe I got my power back here. I don't know. But I was more sub, you know, fed up with anything else. It was 930. It was a Saturday. And this was last week. And I hear a jungle in my backyard. And I'm yeah, like... They don't let up, man. They don't let up. And I'm, I'm like, fuck no. I open up my pool screen and, you know, I'm just looking and hearing out there. And I'm like, what can I do? There's like 30 of them. It's 930 in the morning, like I said. So I grit... Grit? <laughs> I grit it all, baby. I get my Bluetooth speakers and I have three of them. And they're pretty good quality and they're pretty loud. And I'm sorry to all my other neighbors around me, but I had to I had to get my power back. I put all of the speakers on our pool deck and just blasted Beyonce. You know, that was my idea of a bad time for them because they must hate her. I mean, if they're doing their own thing. Or maybe I just wanted to enjoy the loud music with her. But then my husband was like, oh, no, 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 no. Beyonce, are we giving them a fucking concert? Yeah. No. We need to turn it on Slipknot repetitively <laughs> for five hours. <laughs> Oh my God! Scream to screamo music, and it was going on for five hours. So I'm pretty sure that ruined whatever thing was going on in their backyard. I think they maybe had to take it inside at that point. So this was like 9:30 a.m. Yes. Okay, and yes. you know what? Yeah, I know you said it was a Saturday, but I think it was actually like a weekday, and Dylan was You're trying right. to you work. You're right. It was a Friday because I was at work. You guys had right. told me about it. It was a Friday. So you, Dylan was he he works from home, is literally trying to get work done. And he ha is listening to drum beats yep. for hours on end. No so, big deal. Yeah, so it was. That's worse. It, you can't even like you. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. So then, you know, not only are we dealing with that, my husband's like, you know, I'm gonna go out there and I'm gonna call the cops. So he goes out there right in front of them, and this happened. This was a couple days ago. The people saw him on the phone and probably just assumed he was calling the cops because it was midnight. Now, Dylan could have been talking on the phone to anybody. It didn't necessarily have to be the cops. The cops didn't show up there because ultimately the cops decided not to just based on the fact that these people just tried to climb our fence. Yeah. So if Dylan was outside, the people tried to <laughs> climb the nice. fence and were like, do you speak Spanish? And Dylan's like, no, I don't speak Spanish. And then they tried to climb the fence. And Dylan runs back inside as he's actually on the phone with the police, even though you know they didn't know that he was. And he runs inside screaming this to me. And, of course, I'm mad because I begged him not to go outside. I don't want to die. You know, if these people are dangerous. Yeah, and maybe people. they're not. You know, maybe they probably aren't killing humans. I'm not going to assume they are. That's pretty terrible. But, right. you know, maybe they are just into killing things. And that's enough for me to be scared. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm not into that. For like, fun. just like, let's not poke the bear. Let's not poke the bear. All 30 bears. Mm -hmm. Since we have, you know... A couple weapons in our home, but only two of us to defend ourselves. My dogs are small. They're not going to help be cujoing them. Definitely not. You know? So I just want to not get involved in that. 
but I'm now dealing with this. This is my life. We have basically a religious, I wouldn't say cult, because they probably think this is a religion, but there is a large gathering of people that like to kill things, they like to chant, and they like to get out bongo drums. I'm just going to go, I'm, we can call it a cult. L- l- you know what? Our podcast is called Humor, Haunts, and Homicides. I'm just saying, we are going to call it that. Thank you. Whatever. And we don't know what it is, so it very well could be a cult. You know, we don't know what religion they I tend mean. to practice. So, to be continued, the story of the Compton's cult. Let me say, though... Is it probably safe to say that after all this drama, like, I probably am not going to get invited back? (laughs) Um, Or would you? (laughs) Yeah, right? Ooh, way to get us back for all the things that Dylan's done wrong, you know? God, they're going to try to, like, turn me against you. I know. Crazy, crazy. All right, Josh. Well, what do you got for us this week? All right, friends. Well, I want you to imagine this. The New Orleans sun is dipped below the horizon, casting long shadows across the French Quarter. Gaslit flickered from ornate balconies, painting a tableau of cobbled streets and wrought iron gates. Beyond the festive music and drunken laughter, a sinister melody whispered from a towering mansion on Royal Street. This was the terror tower of Madame Delphine Lalaurie, a figure whose beauty was masking her cruelty and whose legacy stains the city's history with fear to this day. Quick disclaimer, the story is super dark and morbid, and it focuses on the dark nature of hate crimes related to slavery and racism. You ready to dive in? Let's. Woo! All right. (laughs) Sue. The infamous socialite was born Marie Delphine McCarty on March 19th, 1787. Delphine lived in a world engulfed by wealth and privilege Delphine grew up in a wealthy family where the men had prestige military backgrounds. Her father, Louis B. de McCarty, was knighted as the Chevalier of the Royal and Military Order of St. Louis. The McCarty family owned around 1,350 acres of land, and the family's property was next door to the famous and wealthy Count Pierre Philippe Mendeville de Margeny. (laughs) Now, I'm going to stop right there real quick. I don't know (laughs) if I'm pronouncing many or if all of these words correct or incorrect, so, if any of you out there are history buffs and you know that I'm completely butchering this, I appreciate the hilarious judgment because I'm probably doing so. I mean, I can immediately interject with toxic trait time um, and let you know that it's not, it's Philippe. Oh, I'm sorry. Not Philippe. It would be Philippe, but, uh, but so far, so far, other than that, you're, you know. All right, all good. Yeah, but all I'll, right. I'll just, I'll interject my toxicity and... You know. All right. And that's all I expect out of you, really. <laughs> I mean, it's, that's it. It's, you know, you, you can always expect And that. I promise that if I catch any toxic traits that I can provide to you and your storytelling time, I promise I can oh, return them. I'm sure the you f- will. I'm sure you will. <laughs> all right, friends. All right, let's resume. And play button is a rest. Well, we can only assume that the amount of privilege and influence that the McCarty family had in New Orleans society at that time was extensive. It wasn't only men in the family that had a social standing within the community. Delphine's mother also had a dedicated socialite status herself. She loved throwing parties that went on to all hours of the night. Her mother was even known to play pranks on the men. So when they would get drunk, she would take their clothes and their shoes when they were passed out. And she would take them and soak them after she put them on herself with her girlfriends. And they would just run under the water with them. And they'd be like, oh, oops, my water. I love her. Yeah, me too. And then, basically, she would get them back on in the morning, or then she'd send them home. And that was another thing that I'd read, is that after she'd soak the clothes, she'd be like, all right, everybody, get the fuck out of my house, basically. God. And then they'd be soaked, and then they'd be like, what the fuck? She'd be like, I don't know. What would you guys ener- do when you were drunk? Killer drawing? energy. You know? Killer energy. Yeah. Love her and her badass ways. <laughs> but, unfortunately, you know, everyone's time has to come to an end, and her mother passed away in 1807. And, of course, this left a fractured feeling in the family forever. Her father never remarried, but they did have another child, and he was with a lady named Sophie Moussant. Did I say that right? You know, I'm not not going to... I'm just... I'm not going to pretend to be French. (laughs) I just knew the the Philippe one. Okay, good. So I may have gotten that one correct. Yeah, that's... Okay, mm -hmm. good. All right, but in 1815, Sophie gave birth to a daughter named Delphine Emma C. McCarty. And yes, if you heard that correctly, that means that there are two sisters both named Delphine. That's cool. And messed up. You know? I don't understand that, but okay. Yeah. 
Hey, mm-hmm. Renee and Renee too. I mean, Renee Jr. Who's the why not? You know, who's the senior and who's the junior? And how do you? Anywho. Um, but I do want to note an interesting fact that in this period, slavery was extremely prominent in the society. Interracial relationships were not looked upon lightly and they were behind the scenes done quite often because people still like themselves a mixed relationship, mm-hmm. you know? Nothing wrong with that. And records show that many of the McCarty family men actually had interracial relationships, which, like I said, was not normal for a family of their status even um, back then, especially since they owned slaves and many of them. But also known fact is that Delphine's uncle had a 54-year-old relationship with one of his slaves and had a daughter with her. His wife turned a blind eye to all the other years because the guy ended up having tons of affairs on her because he was just a piece of shit. Yeah. Basically used her and made her feel wealthy and normal and still treated her like shit, but still made her feel safe because he had the control. Knocked her up and then said, you know what, I'm going to screw around everyone and you can't do a damn thing because if you do, I'm going to murder you, basically. Love them. Right? Mm, that's yeah. Awful. Yeah. But ultimately, there was five children born from that interracial relationship. Um, so the guy just had kids all over the place, basically. Nick um, Cannon. Yeah. <laughs> 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 oh, man. Uncle, Ma- Uncle Nick. <laughs> so Delphine was just barely 14 when she got married for the first time for her, um, you know, her 14? Mar- yeah. But back then, that was, pr- you know, arranged know. marriages were forced know, and normal, you had no man. choice. And her first husband's name was Ramon Lopez E. Anglo de la Candelaria. <laughs> that was pretty good, right? That, I loved it. That was great. I, I'm going with that it. That was smooth. Mm-hmm. Uh, Ramon served as an officer of the Spanish crown. He was second in command to the Louisiana governor. But before his marriage to Delphine, he tragically lost his wife on a treacherous voyage from Spain to Louisiana. He blamed the death of his wife on the government because they ended up forcing him to make the journey, even though he expressed concerns due to traveling because the water conditions at that time were extremely rough and he knew the sea. So he said, look, I don't want to travel. This is not right. Um, People are going to, not just me, but people's lives are in danger. And what's the point of this mission if we're just going to be putting ourselves at risk? But ultimately, the Spanish queen and the the crown did not agree with that and they forced him to go anyway. And his wife died. His wife died. So then he defied the orders that, that Spain implemented regarding the human trafficking trade um, and Spain basically wanted to prohibit the importing and exporting of humans from Africa until the hostilities were settled between Spain and Africa and then well Ramon being the jaded and defiant one that he was based on the events that took place proceeded to steal the African-American slaves excuse me African slaves not African-American mm-hmm. uh, which royally pissed off the queen instead of imprisoning him she sent him all over the world on different voyages knowing he didn't want to and that he'd be away from his family which effectively removed him from his prominent position with the queen. And then after many years and an eventual visit to the queen by Delphine, because she was like, look, this is bullshit. And Delphine at the time was very boisterous and she didn't give a shit, even if it was the queen. And she said, look, you know, Ramon was pardoned and um, he was eventually appointed Spanish consul to the New Orleans under the American administration once that French was gone and all that took place. Um, So on January 11th in 1805, Delphine became pregnant and was awaiting Ramon's arrival from home when he was on a voyage, and he was traveling from Havana to New Orleans when his ship hit a sandbar offshore. Um, it was basically in Havana when that killed him. Bro. Yeah. Oh, that's unfortunate. So struck by tragedy, you know, he was he lost his wife on a voyage, and then he ended up dying on a voyage. Yeah. And then Delphine ended up naming her daughter, this is, get ready for this, I might butcher this one. <laughs> Marie Delphine Francisca Borja Lopez y Angola de la Candelaria. Yeah, I practiced that one. Marie Delphine again. Well, yeah. We're just, okay. yeah. But part of the daughter's name was the memory, uh, you know, in memory of Ramon's late wife. I oh. found that interesting that somebody would name part of their daughter's 15 names um, because his daughter, you know, I don't know. Yeah, so he's naming, so she, not he, she named their daughter after both him and his late wife. Correct. Which is like, I mean, it's a I mean, I guess super it's, honorable thing, I sure. guess, but it's just, yeah. that's different. Yeah. Okay. But, you know, honorable is not part of Madame Lodore's well, no, I guess, yeah, definitely not. <laughs> facade here, but she did have to put on this front that she cared about people, you know, so she did try, I think, and her head or she at least guess, wanted people to think she was a good person as we'll soon find out so stay tuned okay, wow. but um delphine went to havana to bury her husband and to have her daughter baptized because she was looking for a higher peace and she thought you know what better way than to get my child baptized in a place that her husband was from and he ultimately passed away 
So um, when she returned home to New Orleans, she found out that the town was no longer under Spanish or French rule and that it was now American owned. So imagine that surprise, like going yeah, right. away on all this tragedy with your family and all your things you're going through, and then your country is no longer what you thought it was. Mm, like, weird. man, okay. I can't even imagine. Um, but then two years later, the young 20-year-old, now widow, was married again. This time it was a few weeks later after her mother's death on her birthday, March 19th, 1807. Delphine had married an older Frenchman and widower, Jean-Paul Blanc, and it was rumored that Jean-Paul saw the marriage as an opportunity because Delphine inherited a third of her mother's estate, which, you know, being young and not really being interested, but seeing it as a business opportunity, mm -hmm. in that inheritance, Delphine also would have received roughly 33000 and that would have been equivalent to about a million dollars in today's money. Okay, right? I'll take it. Yeah. Then, after her second marriage, her father had gifted her and her husband an additional plantation with an additional 26 slaves in a property on Charles Street in New Orleans. And then after this, her assets would have been worth around $2 million in today's money. So, you know, definitely an opportunity mm -hmm. if I'm looking for one. Then, by 1815, Delphine and her husband had a combined total of five children. That... They yeah. got married in 1807, mm -hmm. so eight years, five children. I mean, I guess it's... Yeah. Really? I don't know no, exactly all the names of all the other ones. I couldn't get that in the research that I found. Well, we, we don't have all day. And we don't have all day. <laughs> if one of them was named 18 names, you know. Then yeah, we don't have time for that. We just don't have that time. <laughs> However, it was um, her eldest child, which was part of her first marriage, and um, that was included with the five of the Oh, kids. okay. So four kids in eight years. That's right. not quite as bad, but, you know, still. Right, but, but for her, it's still five kids yeah. in, in that time Correct. frame. So, okay. So, you know, just to kind of clarify. But then less than a year after the Battle of New Orleans, which the battle ended on January 8th of 1815, 50-year-old Jean Blanc passed away, so she struck again with tragedy, from unknown causes. But due to the $160,000 in debts that he had acquired through... Um, whatever he had going on in life, Delphine was stuck having to give back all of her assets to the bank to avoid a complete government seizure for her remaining assets. Oh, that's not good. Not at all. Especially when you have that many kids. Um, yeah. You know, trying to be a woman running society. But, you know, her family was prominent and she had all the money and inheritance. So, you know, as you will learn, she, she kind of makes it out just fine. I mean, yeah, but at this point she would only be like, say like 28 or something, if I'm doing yeah. the math correctly. Yeah. Like, that's a lot. Yeah. Less than thirty. I just couldn't imagine. Yeah, I couldn't imagine it now when I'm, you know, forty-two. You know, it's pretty wild. So then, you know, over the next ten years, Delphine had to auction off much of the Blancs' property, including her slaves, to try to pay off the remaining debts. She even purchased one piece of the property herself at auction, um, just as a you know way to retain some of the slaves. And then some of the records show that eight of the enslaved people she owned had died in roughly five years, but. Oh. Because of her status, people kind of turned the blind eye at that point. Most of these people were children and young women. The causes of deaths were always shown as unknown on the autopsy reports. And while the debts that she had taken on from her second marriage should have been bankrupted and, you know, essentially should have put her under, she again got lucky and picked herself up when her father had left her an inheritance of $5,000, which in today's money is around 157000 and she had gotten two slaves from the acquisition. Mm -hmm. Then in 1825, chiropractor Dr. Louis LaLaurie had come into Delphine's life. Louis. Louis. What did I say? Louis. It's nice. Oh, okay. It's, yeah, nice. you know, it's probably what he properly went by. <laughs> <laughs> then she took one of her children to see him because she said that her child had like a hump in their back. And at that time, and being in the wealth status, you cannot have a child that had a deformity. Oh, so no. immediately she had to rush them to him. And that's when he kind of got into her life. And then romance started. And then in 1826, Delphine had her sixth child out of wedlock with Dr. Lewis. Five months after her son's birth, Delphine and Dr. Lewis officiated their marriage via notary. Delphine had the date of her marriage changed so that way she could get married at the St. Louis Cathedral because she wanted to make it legal in the eyes of the church. She had the date of her marriage changed on the certificate because having a child out of wedlock was not accepted in the high societal times in New Orleans. Wow, so she's... Scandalous! Did you know... Did you know that chiropractors existed that early? Because I honestly did not. Um, I don't remember exactly what they called them, and I didn't note that here. But it, it was not exactly called okay. a chiropractor. But the same kind of thing. No. I still didn't even really... I didn't okay. know until okay. doing okay. this little hmm. stint on research okay. either. But at this time, Delphine is now 42 years old. She's on her third marriage, okay. six children, and boy, she is rich. Archived letters from Delphine to friends reveal that the marriage was on the rocks for her third marriage. 
Some of the letters that were archived also begin to tell a tale of cruelty starting with her slaves. In 1831, Delphine purchased a new home, which is now infamously the haunted LaLaurie Mansion. And then she filed for divorce from her husband, Louis LaLaurie. Okay. Yeah. It is believed that Madame Delphine LaLaurie started mistreating slaves between the years 1831 and 1834. There were reports in 1838 from Harriet Martineau stating that residents said that Delphine's slaves appeared to be singularly haggard and wretched. It is known that Delphine was polite to black people in public settings and often voiced concerns about the health and basically of enslaved people. So she was in public voicing, hey, like this is not right. Overcompensating. Overcompensating, mm-hmm. you know. And then, um, you know, interesting enough, between 1830 and 1834, there were 12 funeral registered documents stating that 12 slaves had died with all known causes, which were stated as unknown. So interesting. Mm-hmm. Among 12 of these deaths, they include a cook, a laundress, Boone, and her four children. The ages of her children range from 4 to 13. Mm. Yeah, terrible. And then the court records of that time show that Lori had freed two slaves, Jean Louis in 1819 and De Vince in 1832. Harriet Martineau, I think that's Martin, yeah, Martineau. I think so. I think so. Uh, wrote the public rumors about LaLaurie's mistreatment of slaves on her property, which were sustained. Uh, and the, lo- the local lawyer basically was dispatched to the property for the mansion and wanted to remind LaLaurie that the laws said that you have to upkeep your slaves and you can't mistreat them, even though that never happened. Mm-hmm. And that was just something he had to say at that time. And then during the visit, they found the basically no evidence of wrongdoing or mistreatment of the slaves by Delphine LaLaurie. So it went on for a little while, but Martin had also spoke of some other terrifying tales later after doing some more research. Um, she had stated that 1836, after the lawyer visited the LaLaurie house, one neighbor had saw an eight-year-old fall from the death, basically, um, from a rooftop on the top of the mansion. It is said that she was trying to avoid a whip beating punishment from Delphine, and then later reports state that the girl's name who fell was Leah, or L-I-A, which I guess would still be pronounced Leah. I think Leah. Yeah, or Leah. It depends on how you, you know, choose that. But she was brushing Delphine's hair, and then she had hit a snag, and then Delphine basically went crazy whipping her. But according to Martineau, this incident led to another investigation at the Lorries. Lori was found guilty of illegal cruelty, and then was forced to forfeit nine slaves out of the household. The girl Leah was allegedly who fell out of the window. She was found um, nowhere at the time. Nobody could find her. And then the neighbor was labeled a liar, basically, because nobody could substantiate those claims. Harriet also recounted that Lori kept her cook chained to the kitchen stove and would regularly beat her daughter senseless if they showed any sort of remorse or if they even tried to help feed them or pat them or, you know, because they're kids. They don't want to see that by general nature. But then on April 10th, 1834, a massive fire broke out in the LaLaurie residence on Royal Street. It first started in the kitchen, and then when the police and the fire department showed up at the home, they found that the cook, a 70-year-old woman, was beaten chained to the stove by her ankle. She had said that um, the fire was set on fire. What's it? The fire was set on fire? (laughs) That doesn't even make sense. She had (laughs) set it on fire in an attempt to commit suicide. She would then have rather died than basically being dealing with Delphine's horror like, another day. Imagine choosing burning to death. Yeah. Over the torture that you like, the torture must have been so severe. Mm-hmm. If that was like her way out, terrible. That's awful. I mean, for me at least, I don't know about you, but I would rather not die out of any way I could die. Of course not. With by fire. No, burning would, is a terrible... Terrible. Oh, wow. Absolutely terrible. And thinking that you might even live and being... Th- no, no, no. No, thank you. Mm. Not for me. Okay. Um, she basically states that the slaves were always punished upstairs and that the ones that were upstairs never came back. So that was always something known when they the neighbors were looking out through the property. The New Orleans Bee, which was the local news reporting at the time... Uh, said that on April 11th, 1834, bystanders reported that the house's fire attempted to enter the residence. And then to, this was basically to ensure that all slaves got out alive. So the fire department tried to get into the home, tried to get everyone out if they could. And then upon refusing getting in with the keys by the LaLaurie family, bystanders ended up breaking into the home and found that there were seven slaves mutilated. The slaves were suspended by their necks and their limbs were stretched and torn from one extremity to the other. The ones that were still alive were said to be up there for months being tortured. Terrible. I hate it. Terrible. One of those who entered the premises was Judge 
Jean Francois, which he went by the name J.F. Canange? Canange? I mean, I'm going with it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The judge had said that in the mansion he found, and I quote, a negress wearing an iron collar and an old Negro woman who had received a very deep wound on her neck who was too weak to be able to walk. Canange had said when he was questioned that Lori's husband um, had all these people on the property that were enslaved, and he was told that in, ir in an irritable manner that some people had better stay off the home or else he was going to dictate laws and meddle in other people's businesses. A version of the story circulated in 1836 and was recounted by Martineau. They were adding that the slaves were emaciated. Ama <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one. Emaciated, <laughs> showing signs of being flayed with a whip, and they were bound in restrictive postures, and they had spiked collars and kept their heads in static positions. Oh, yeah. All of this is bad. Yeah. With the discovery of the slave mistreatment, a mob of local citizens attacked the LaLaurie mansion. They destroyed everything that they could get their hands on. The remaining slaves were taken to the local jail, where it's said that about roughly 4,000 people had attended to view the slaves and to convince themselves of their suffering. How sick like is that? Like a sideshow or something? No, they were basically saying, like, I don't believe that Madame oh, LaLaurie did this. Okay. I want to see for myself how these people were mistreated because I got to see to believe. Okay. Which I think is shitty from everything that they witnessed throughout the neighborhood and right, the, pain, the, right. the, the visits on the property and they still come to that conclusion. But back then with the proprietal woman in society, no way could she have done that. I must see for myself. Mm, okay. You know? So then the Pittsfield Sun, citing the New Orleans advisor and writing several weeks after the evacuation of the Lowry residence, they found that the two slaves were still in the mansion and they had died um, basically doing the rescue. They weren't found in time. And it was also noted that while the police were digging in the yard, they had found the bodies in the ground and they were also condemned in a well. So and it wasn't really noted how many bodies they found exactly, but it was one of those bodies that they found, the little girl Leah, who was reported jumping from the roof. Oh, the one that the neighbor was accused of being a liar. Yes. So noted that even though Lori was publicly condemned, she still had one loyal servant. Amid the mayhem of trying to escape, the enslaved coachman brings her carriage around the side of the house. The horses get her, basically, and she runs. Nobody could catch up to her. They even tried. They even like end up hurting the horses to try to get her off this wagon, mm -hmm. but she somehow gets away. Um, her slaves bring her to the dock in New Orleans Navigation Company, which was on Lake Pontchartrain, Pontchartrain where she boarded and fled. When the coachman arrived back to town, the mob destroyed the carriage and stabbed the horses to death. Why is it always the horses, man? That's mean. I feel like in every horror movie or flick that I'm in or watching... Do horses, it's horses always, get a bad rap? Like, think of The Walking Dead. It's always, they, the horses get eaten. Mm -hmm. The Ring, the movie about the little Samara oh, girl. The Ring too. Yeah, yeah. The, mm -hmm, the horses are always falling into the, and dying, drowning. Mm -hmm. um, it's just so many other horror movies I can't think of now, but I can think of just horses in general dying. Which is not right. The horses did nothing, people. Aww. Save the horses. Anywho. <laughs> Peter will thank me. Um, so just as the story surrounding her cruel and heinous actions towards slaves has circulated and amped up, so have the speculations and rumors about where exactly she ended up. It turns out that the American poet William Cullen Bryant had published a journal that uncovers the mystery for us. Bryant had wrote that he had set sail for France out and about New York in June 25th, 1834, he had stated that one of his passengers was a pretty-looking French woman, a Madame Lori. So she didn't even care. She didn't hide her name. She was like, you know what? I'm in France. Fuck you all. I'm Madame Lori. And yeah, I did that shit. Um, he went on to describe the atrocities that she had been accused of because she talked about it in public. She said that she had been committed of such horrible cruelties upon her slaves last winter in New Orleans, adding that her home had caught fire in an attempt to extinguish a blaze and it was discovered that several Negroes were confined, some chained in painful postures, and others wounded and scarcely alive. Madame Lori's reputation had made it across the country. Ryan also wrote that Delphine had spent time in Mobile, Alabama, before making a journey out from New York with her husband to his native country. Then Delphine and Louis, and I, I you know... I realized that I'm being defiant on this Louis thing. You were very defiant. I want to say Louis because it's you know it's spelled Louis like Saint Louis, and clearly you better put yourself in the I French know. mindset. I'm trying You're to. A Frenchman. Uh, it's not because I don't want to. Just you know, so if I if I fuck that up, 
let it be, <laughs> I guess, for that particular word. I did let it be many times. <laughs> let it be. Let it be. All right. Um, well, they ended up basically in Paris with all of her band of kids coming over for extended stays. Lulius. Lu- <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> gotcha. Lived off of Delphine's wealth, but grew tired of her complaining and left her in Paris as he made his way to Havana. So then shortly after, more Delphine's family moved to Paris, where she, they pretty much all occupied different homes. And then she undeservingly had her family back together again. Because well, all is well in this bitch's All is life. good cool. for her. Good for she her. got everything this she bitch. wanted. Then, Madame Daphel mccarty Lalori died in Paris on December 7th, 1849. Letters between her and her children note that she was dealing with a lingering illness. It could only be assumed that she had pretty much succumbed to that illness. And her death... And the cause of it is unknown. But she is said to have died at her home. Probably asleep. Undeservingly. This bitch. I, don't I know. know. Mm-hmm. Yep. But even in death, rumors swirled around about Delphine. In 1941, claims were made that a mysterious epitaph... Oh, how the hell do you say epitaph. that? Thank you so much. Mm-hmm. Plate was discovered in St. Louis's number one cemetery. The weathered and corroding plate had the words, Madame LaLaurie, Ne Marie Delphine McCarty, Decede a Paris le 7 de December 1842. Paris. Yeah. Wouldn't they say? I don't Maybe. Okay, I'm yeah, just going. That's a lot. <laughs> uh, records in Paris show that December 9th, 1849, Marie Delphine McCarty was presented for burial. And then she was buried in a tomb of the Nada and Noel families. But her body was exhumed on January 7th, 1851 and sent to be back to New Orleans. The day on the plate found in St. Louis's number one cemetery did have the incorrect date. The number two was so worn that it was misread. Okay. Yeah, so that was something that they found later on. But going into the haunting of her mansion, because this is where things kind of take place currently, the mansion has an infamous dark history attached to it. Most of the grim storytelling of the property is around Madame LaLaurie, and what a lot of people don't know there is that murder would happen there constantly. Um, when they walk by, they just think that it's a beautiful place to go because uh, the mansion was then converted into apartments. And then, you know, in 1894, one of the tenants living in that mansion was brutally murdered in his room. All of his belongings were ransacked, and the tenant appeared to be a victim of a robbery gone wrong. And then one chilling tale is that one of the victim's friends said that the house had a demon in it, and it wasn't going to rest until it met his end. So this guy living there really thought that some demon was, like, trying to get him. Wow. Um, so what do you think? Do you think that the mansion was haunted or that a demon was possessing it or, you know, just the lingering effect of everything horrendous that she did was there? I mean, I'm going to go with I would believe more of haunting than demon. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I would say you're probably right. I'm going to go with, yeah. But, you know, maybe, if it, if you believe this, maybe a demon possessed LaLaurie to do these crazy, terrible things. Absolutely not. Yeah, some could argue that. <laughs> okay. I'm not on that train, but I like to argue devil's advocate, sure. Okay, okay. You know, for the funness of the conversation. Um, let's see. So, it's also said that during the mid to late 19th century, that the Lori Mansion was an all-girl school for a brief moment in time, and it had a few mixed races going on in the school, and it was one of the few schools like that in New Orleans. But it was during the Reconstruction era. So the school was transformed at that point to an all-girls school. And then it was an all-African-American all, like, all African American school. Okay. And then within that short amount of time after the conversion, reports of assault became lighting to a lot of people. The students would approach teachers screaming with tears rolling down their faces. Their sleeves were rolled up. Their flesh was exposed with bruises, scratches on their forearms. One of them was even flayed. When somebody asked who did this, the answer was always the same for each student. They would just say, that woman. Mm. Yeah. And yeah. then, um, you know, it was it the spirit of Twisted Delory? Was it the demon that allegedly murdered the tenants in 1894? See, I'm going with, I'm going with the spirit of Twisted Delory. I think so. They, that woman. I mean, nobody knows who that is, but it yeah, is a right? woman. So we do know that. So although not everyone believes in psychics or mediums, there was one particular instance made known to the Ghost City Tours team in which somebody was on one of the tours and they happened to be a medium. And then throughout the entire night, she had sensed things about various locations on the tour before even really being told the story of it. So she would walk mm. up to something and she'd tell it. Before, she would, like, feel it. Right, right. and the, before the tour guy would even say it. But if, it was within the first sight of the LaLaurie Mansion, the medium sucked in, like, a deep, sighing breath, and she just said, like, such sadness with, like, a, a modest tone. Um, and then she whispered, and she kind of, like, rocked back on her heels, too. So she, you could tell that something was kind of, like, taking over her. 
And then she pulled out a phone. Um, she proceeded to snap a picture of the mansion. And she just said, like, that bricked up window. And then she went on. Nobody really understood what that meant. And then she looked up and said, that's not where the little girl had fallen out of the mansion. And then the tour guide paused and said simply because she hadn't gotten to that part of the story. But she goes, uh, nevertheless, uh, you know, you're right. The, the, the little girl, Leah, had fell from the courtyard. Um, you know, as for the bricked window, I suspect that somebody did some interior decorating, but wanted to remain, you know, the symmetry on the outside of the home. Okay. Yeah. And then in the following minutes, the medium experienced such emotion that the weight had kind of settled down on her, on, like on her, upon her shoulders. And she said that she had sensed the spirit of a young boy who liked to play pranks on the living and the spirit of a little girl who was often nervous. Yeah. And then when she had asked, you know, was there any helplessness or anger? She said no. But whatever happened then with LaLaurie, she does not visit the house any longer. So what do you think? Do you think that the time, the crimes were still LaLaurie after this median had kind of said that? Or do you think it was something more sinister? Well, I mean, I think maybe... Because I don't think that there's been anything um, that they've talked about recently. Right. So maybe she, maybe that is right. Like maybe she's moved on or, I mean, again, I don't really know how it all works. Yeah. But, Man. But wow. Crazy. Crazy, crazy lady. And yeah, great job, really. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, that one was fun. I enjoyed that one. All right. What crime do you have for me this week, friend? Well, today I have the murder of Skylar Niece, and it's pretty terrible. Oh, so, no. Yeah, it's, it was not, not fun, but, okay. you know. Give it to me. <laughs> so, Skylar Annette Niece was born on February 10th, 1996, to Mary and Dave Niece. She was an only child, and by all accounts, she had a nice, normal upbringing. She grew up in Sheet Lake, West Virginia, which is a suburb northeast of Morgantown, West Virginia. In second grade, she met Sheila Eddy, who would become her best friend. Even though they lived about 20 miles apart at the time, they immediately became best friends. Skylar and Sheila were inseparable. So they would have been about eight years old okay. um, at this point. <clears throat> in October 2010, Skylar's family moved to Star City, which is a tiny city enclosed by the city of Morgantown. And Sheila's family also moved to Morgantown, and they began their freshman year in high school at University High. By this point, they've been best friends for six to seven years, so they're very close. Sure. Um, and finally able to, you know, be living next to each other, which would be really fun as you know, with your BFF. Oh, yeah. While at University High, they met Rachel Schof, who was an aspiring actress and singer. She grew up very religious and attended Catholic school prior to University High. This will come in handy later. Okay. <laughs> The three started hanging out together and quickly began getting into trouble, doing things like drinking, smoking weed, staying out late past curfew. Normal teenage shit. Yeah, but I mean, they're 14. Yeah. Okay, well, I mean, like there was there was me and then there was you, I guess, because I was... Homegirl was... We, were, we had seven kids in our household, so we were terrible. Most of us were terrible. Okay, yeah. Homegirl yeah. was a goody-goody up in here, so... Yeah. Sorry, parents. I love you. <laughs> Supposedly, according to both Skylar and Rachel's parents and certain friends, Sheila was the bad influence and was in, even described as being mean and controlling. Skylar always brushed this off and would always defend her best friend. However, adding Rachel to the mix definitely did start changing the dynamic of their friendship um, after a little while. So. Can't have a menage a trois. Well. <laughs> or try. Well, it's, I mean, it's funny you say that. Um, this culminated in the summer of 2011 during their sophomore year when Skylar witnessed Sheila and Rachel having drunken sex together during a sleepover. Oh, I predicted that shit. Oh, yeah, okay. so. <laughs> All right. Skylar and Sheila argued that night and a rift began to form between them. Obviously, Sheila and Rachel started becoming much closer after that. So you've got the two original BFFs are like rifting. And yeah. then obviously, you know, her new piece is... Um, Ugh, getting a Shania Twain yeah, action no. going. <laughs> so, they would start dressing alike, hanging out by themselves, leaving Skylar feeling completely excluded and left out. They even began arguing on social media. At one point, Skylar wrote on Twitter on September 6, 2011, quote, I tell the whole school all the shit I have on everyone, which is a lot. Hashtag if I could get away with it. How thankful are you, Josh, that we didn't have social media like that growing up? Well, in my era, I had AOL instant messaging. We, I had that a little bit. So, I, I mean, it wasn't as public in a forum unless you were in a chat room with people that you maybe knew. Yeah. But 
Um, I actually, funny story to, to Paula, I'm sorry to interrupt you. No, you're good. I came out of the closet on AOL Insta Message. Hey yeah, I don't know if I ever told you that story. Hey, but, I am. What yeah. was your screen name? Oh my gosh, I had a couple of them. Oh, my original one. Oh, this is great. It was Circus Freak Josh. <laughs> <laughs> Circus Freak Josh. Nice. What was yours? Um, so, <laughs> I know I've told you the story before about how I changed my name when I was 18. Alexa? Yeah. Oh, crap. I have to turn my speaker off on Yeah, mine. she's going to start talking. Okay, there we go. Um, so, I changed my name to Alexa. I went by that for a few years. Mm-hmm. It's not my proudest yeah. moment. And you know what? Um, but whatever. Sometimes we need a little Sasha Fierce in our life. <laughs> My screen name was Alexa Timby. Oh, Timby. Because I love Justin Timberlake. Oh my God. <laughs> and of course it is. So, of course it Alexa is. Timby at AOL. Whoa. And then after, when I decided um, that I was going to become Renee again, oh, yeah. um, I changed it to Renee Giraffe because I love giraffes. And it literally, like, that's still my email address now. How and old were you when so, you changed your name for the second time? Like to when back, you prince back yourself. to Renee? Yeah, to Renee Giraffe. What year? What? Oh, um, I don't know. I was 18 when I did the Alexa thing. Probably 20. Oh, okay. It was like a two-year thing. It was like a two-year thing. I was thing. in my head thinking like maybe there, you were like 11. No. No. Okay. There, there are people that I met at a job as Alexa who still would know me more as that right. than they would as Renee. Okay. Like I'm friends with them still. Shout out. Well, Nick, Nick and Jeremy. Well, my, my, my <laughs> French friend, Alexa Rene. You know. Anyway, I guess I should get back into my story. Oh, hey, yeah. story. How you doing? <laughs> oh, wow. Where were we? <clears throat> social media, yes. Yes, social media. So basically, Skylar had written the whole tweet thing about I could tell the whole school, which was probably a nod to the sexual encounter of her friends. You know, so she's, she's drawn blood, you know. Yeah. Um, so anyway... Their friendship did continue, but it just increasingly became more and more strained. I think that Skylar was just so desperate to hold on to her best friend. It must have been really hard watching someone you know that you've been so close with for so long start to slip away. I mean, yeah. could you imagine? No. Like, I mean, you've been best friends since you were eight. This is mm. this is like your ride or die, and yeah. now it's it's just all going away. Yeah. You know, <clears throat> I do feel bad about that. So. This went on for months. On July 4th, 2012, Skylar tweeted, It really doesn't take much to piss me off. And, sick of being at fucking home. Thanks, friends, in quotations. Love hanging out with you all too. The next day, she tweeted, You doing shit like that is why I can never completely trust you. So, she's basically being ghosted by friends. Yeah. And, again... I really am happy about not having social media in school because just some of the bullshit that I would have put out there. <laughs> I know. You I know? Was so, yeah, I was an angry damn kid. I mean, I went back to look at my yearbook. I don't know if you've ever done that as like a little time capsule on yourself. I have. Um, a lot of my comments said that I was a mean teenager, Be, you know? So. See, I didn't have that, but still, I just imagine the embarrassing shit I would have read. I, yeah. Woo, thank God for that. Uh-huh. Sure. <laughs> On July 5th, Skylar got home from her job at Wendy's around 10 p.m. She said goodnight to her parents and went into her room. Around midnight, she was contacted by Sheila and Rachel, asking her if she wanted to go drive around and smoke weed with them. Now, after she was seemingly ghosted by them the night before, she was probably very excited that they wanted to hang out with her. So Skylar was like, bet, and snuck out of her bedroom window by using a bench underneath. Sheila parked her car next to the apartment, Skylar got into the car, and they were off. In the trunk of the car, Sheila and Rachel had brought a shovel, oh, no. a fresh set of clothes in case they got messy, towels, and cleaning supplies. Oh, a Home Depot supply. Yeah, truck. so this, is, th- yeah. this isn't this is going well, nope. you know. Nope. They began driving towards Blacksville, which was about 40 miles away. Now, this was a familiar route to all of them, as that was the town where Sheila's dad lived. So this wouldn't have been seemed suspicious at all, okay. you know, driving you know this far away. Yeah. Um, Sheila drove into a wooded area just across the Pennsylvania border and parked her car. They had smoked marijuana here before, so again, nothing suspicious. This is normal. Okay. Once they were out of the car, they pretended to have forgotten the lighter and sent Skylar back for it. When she had her back turned, Sheila and Rachel counted to three and started stabbing St- Skylar in the back repeatedly. Oh, my now, God. Now, mind you, they're 16 years old. They're 16 years old. So they only kept her as a friend after the cheating scandal because she they wanted to get her. Right. 
Yeah. So wow. and this mm-hmm. was probably planned from that moment on. Yeah, they had been planning things for a while. Apparently there had been things that had been said um in months prior that were just kinda like brushed off. Wow. But as you can see now, mm, something was, was definitely cooking. So, yeah, terrible. Terrible. They had brought kitchen knives hidden in their hoodies. So just like stolen kitchen knives from the, it, I can't imagine at 16 I I can't imagine now, but at 16 it's just insane. Rape or I'm sorry, Skylar tried to run away, but they tackled her and kept stabbing. At one point she was actually able to get Rachel's knife from her and cut her in the in the ankle, but unfortunately she was overpowered. In her last moments, she was just asking them why, and as they just stood over her while she died. Terrible. They had originally planned to bury her, but the ground was too hard, so they ended up just covering her with branches and rocks. They washed themselves up at a nearby creek and disposed of their bloody clothes and knives. They left Skylar's turned-off cell phone next to her body. This all took a couple hours, and they were home before dawn. Wow. Left her. That afternoon, Skylar's dad, Dave, came home and noticed that her bedroom door was still closed, which was very unusual. It was also locked from the inside. He then went outside and noticed the bench outside of her bedroom window, so he knew that she had likely snuck out at some point the night before. He immediately calls Sheila, which is her best friend, right. to see if she had any idea about where Skylar was. Which is the logical move as the parent. Yeah. Of course. Sheila admitted to speaking to her on the phone, but that she had not seen her. When she didn't show up to Wendy's for work that evening, the nieces called the police. Now, in a weird twist of events, Sheila did end up calling back later that night and d- admitted that she and Rachel had actually picked up Skylar and went for a drive. But she hadn't admitted this before because she thought that they would just get in trouble. So right. that's, that's, that's her excuse. Yeah. You know? According to her, they picked her up around 11 p.m. and dropped her back off around midnight. She and her mother soon arrived at the niece residence to help look for Skylar by going door to door to talk to neighbors. Like this, this bitch it's like the husband that's murdered their wife and shows up to the funeral and goes on the search yeah oh oh my god it's awful. i hate this bitch yeah they were able to obtain the security footage from the apart the apartment complex where you could see skylar voluntarily getting into a vehicle at 12 31 a.m <clears throat> it was so grainy though that they were unable to tell what kind of vehicle it was this was obviously was her getting into sheila's car and their timeline is wrong but they had no question to, you know, like no reason to question her story. So they didn't look at the footage any further. They were just like, she got, she voluntarily gets into this car or whatever. Um, the police advised the nieces to wait it out because Skylar had clearly ran away on her own. But she had left things in the house like her contact lenses and phone charger. So she clearly had every intention in coming back. Sure. Um, the, her, and her parents knew there's no way our daughter just ran away. There's no way. No. Um, so, you know, all this time too, they're like putting up missing posters. Sheila and Rachel are like joining the, it, it's just gross. Well, they, I mean, it's just gross. It I is, mean, obviously you know that they're trying to cover their tracks. That's what, that's what they're doing. It's but, terrible. But that's what they have. Ugh. I mean, if you're going to murder someone, what else do you do? Yeah. Either you turn yourself in or you try to blend in. Yeah. So remember, this all occurred on July 6th, like early mornings in July 6th. Sure. School starts on August 16th with still no sign of Skylar. On September 3rd, the detectives decided to review more of the surveillance, surveillance footage. <laughs> what? <laughs> surveillance. Surveillance, right? yeah, bitch. No, I'm just making up words up in here. And when they were able to see that Sheila and Rachel did not pick up Skylar at 11 p.m. like they had initially said. So none of that was on surveillance at all. I also want to know, how is it taking them two months to decide to review this footage? Like Because FBI and detectives uh, suck. They don't do what they need to do. Or they're not, they're not properly staffed, too. And sometimes that happens I know, that, in, that's in high pro- crime focus areas. That's probably it. You know? And I guess, too, they also, they're just thinking, this girl's a runaway. Right. At this point, that's really what they were thinking. Yeah. So, you know. So for months, it seemed like not a lot was going on, but they actually were building a case. I think at this point, they're noticing that there's weird behavior with Skylar and Rachel. They're kind of building a a case. Sure. Eventually, Rachel broke down and confessed in January 2013 after suffering some sort of breakdown and being admitted to a psychiatric hospital for five days. So she had a breakdown enough where her parents admitted her. Um, So after five days, she's released. And the police are going to have an interview with her. Just a few minutes into the interview, she just blurted out, we stabbed her. Wow. (laughs) And the police were expecting, like, 
to hear she OD'd and we covered it up. Something like that. They definitely were not expecting what they heard. You got to give it for honesty, you know? Give yeah. It a, man. When they asked why, she stated that they just simply didn't like her anymore. Oh, you know what? Like, that's a reason to murder. The fuck? <laughs> Now, I think that there's more to it. There is a lot of speculation that they murdered her because they were afraid of telling the secret of, like, their sexual relationship. I had mentioned earlier about Rachel being in a a heavily religious upbringing. Yeah. And that would have... Like in a a strict Catholic upbringing, like you're you're not gay, like you can't be gay, True. like that's just not something that is accepted. No, um, even though it's bullshit, yeah. but, you know. So I think that it's more that than just we didn't like her anymore. But you know who knows? Awful. Rachel took investigators to where Skylar's remains were, but she wasn't able to pinpoint the exact location. It, you know, it had been six months at this point, mm-hmm. you know. Yeah. Um, there was too much snow on the ground also, so they were going to have to wait until the snow melted. So they waited two weeks, and two weeks later, on January 16th, Skylar's remains were recovered. During this whole time, Rachel was able to just roam free while they're completing their investigation, which I think is insane. I get it to a point because, like, they're not, at this point, they're not, they're trying to build a case against Sheila as well because she's, you know, agreed to testify against her and all this. So I guess I get it, but no. Yeah. It wasn't until March 13th that the news was made public about Skylar being found. Like, they find her in January and they don't make it public until March. I think they, I mean, there was all this, you know, having to identify her, but they knew, like, literally the killer brought them to the remains. So I'm... So, what, not only was the weather on a thaw period, the the amount of the investigation it's also crazy. had to wait yeah, so for the is, winter to thaw. I just don't like, like that. The they're, and then these bitches are just roaming free, living their life, you know. Oh, my God. So, when the news is made public, Sheila tweets. You're going to love this one. Oh. Rest easy, Skylar. You'll always be my best friend. You mm. fucking bitch. And then Rachel, now, the, the one, Rachel tweets something as well, which I think is crazy, because I'm like, bitch, you literally have already confessed to this. Like, people are going to know, whatever. Rachel writes, rest in peace, baby. I love and miss you more than anything. May you finally have justice. <laughs> well, you're, I mean, she's about to, but. What? So now it wasn't until May 1st that Rachel was forced to surrender herself to authorities as previously agreed upon. Yeah, okay. So she's, again, all this time. She pled guilty to the murder and agreed to testify against Sheila and was sentenced to 30 years in prison on February 26, 2014, but could be eligible for parole in 10 years. Are you fucking kidding me? They're 16. So, unfortunately, even though they're being tried as adults, there still is, like, a level of mercy that they give them, which I don't agree with. What? But... You know what? No, let me pause there. You get grace for smoking weed and coming home late. You get grace for becoming pregnant at 16. You don't get fucking grace for murdering your best friend because you don't like her. Stabbing her in the back. Stabbing her literally in the back. That's gross. And then writing a tweet Mm -hmm. and helping in the investigation of trying to find the murderers all while you and your friend are are that person yeah it's it's yeah oh that, mm-hmm. yeah and sheila's it's not going to get any better for you <laughs> because sheila ultimately pled guilty to first degree murder mur- murder yes. wow <laughs> and was sentenced to life in prison in quotes with mercy which means that she will be eligible for parole after only 15 years what the fuck, man? Like, what's the point of of sentencing someone to life when in 15 years they could get out? You know. They will have a college degree by 35 years old. Think about that. Yeah. They could move on and get, they can run a, their own little business and not even register and nobody would know. Yeah. Like, how, t- ooh. Bitch. Well, there is a, a little light shown on this. In May of 2023, Rachel was actually up for parole for okay. her 10 years. Okay. And she was immediately denied. Um, however, they do list that her projected release is April 30th of 2028. And that math is ain't math in front No, it does not math. Because if she was sentenced to 30 years, and then and that was in 2014, okay, now she's up for parole 10 years later in 23. Then in five years, then that's when her... So, like, she's only going to serve 15 years. And with good behavior, she could be out sooner than that. Exactly. Oh, my... So... This just... Everybody, this is not justice. It's not justice. This it's is terrible. not justice. 
Um, but yeah, that's that's the terrible fucking murder of Skylar Niece. You and know what? She was just, she seemed like just a sweet girl who wanted to keep her friends. And wow, it's bad. Wow. Yeah, it's terrible. So fucked up. So fucked up. You know what? I never wish ill on anyone, but I hope that jail treats her terribly. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah. In prison. I mean, because yeah. jail is just Agreed. temporary. <laughs> that's all I'll say. Get him, tiger. Wow. Wow. Great job. I love that. Thanks. That was amazing. All right. Today's show notes for the Madame LaLaurie and the Haunting of Her Mansion story is the Wikipedia article for the Delphine LaLaurie mansion and the fire of her mansion. Ghost City Tours website for the haunted places for LaLaurie's mansion and grunge.com's article for the killer herself, Delphine LaLaurie. And the sources for my story are SkylarNeeseMurder.com, uh, Wikipedia's article on Skylar Niece, and I did also listen to the episode of Generation Y podcast um, on her murder, which was number 327. It was oh. very good. I really actually liked it a lot. Yeah, great. Oh, and the rest of everything else will be in the show notes. Absolutely. All right, friends. Well, thank you so much for sticking with us on episode three. We really appreciate you coming we here. We love you guys so much. Love you so much for our third time's a charm episode. Yes. And you know what? Very important, you guys. Mystery doesn't sleep. And neither do we. Bye, Bye bitch. <laughs>